Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Felix Hohn. I'm a professor here at the College of Law. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the college this afternoon. And to those joining us on live stream, welcome. Also, if you're joining us on live stream, I hope you are joining us. There were some tef technical difficulties. Hopefully, they're resolved now. If we, OK, you might see a thumbs up. If we do cut out, hopefully, we'll cut in again. And in any event, there will be a recording available. Uh, so we're delighted so many of you could join us uh, for this special lecture this afternoon. And we thank you for your attendance. I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered here today on Treaty 6 territory and the ancestral homeland of the Métis people. In honoring this land's rich history, we pay our utmost respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors who have shaped this place and in doing so, reaffirm our profound connection with one another. I would like to express our gratitude to McCurcher LLP, whose generous sponsorship enables our college to host these lectures. These lectures enrich the minds of our law students and those who attend. I would also like to thank our guest speaker, Senator McFedrin, for joining us here today all the way from Ottawa. I know you're taking time out of your busy schedule to share your expertise with us here today. And we truly appreciate your valuable insights and contributions to this event, and we welcome you to the college. Or I should say back to the college, since you've been here before. Um, Senator McFedrin is a human rights lawyer, educator, activist, and Order of Canada member, appointed an independent senator on the recommendation of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in November 2016 recognized for co-leadership in developing constitutional equality rights. She sponsors Bill 201 to lower the federal or the voting age uh, federally to 16, as well as Bill S-261. Uh, the short title for that is the Can't Buy Silence Act to stop misuse of non-disclosure agreements by entities receiving federal funding. In addition to her distinguished career, as I alluded to, Senator McFedrin served as a Salos Chair at the College of Law at, here in 2007-2008. Uh, and a top priority on her Senate agenda is engaging in facilitating contributions by diverse young leaders in Canadian parliamentary affairs and global multilateralism. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Senator McFedrin. I think we're going to do a switch on our, uh, oh, I've already got the thumbs up. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Hone. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you to Dean Philipson for the invitation to come back to the law school. It's been way too many years. Um, like probably everybody in this room and joining us online, COVID was kind of a wipeout in a bunch of different ways. And so I realized as the plane was landing just after midnight uh, two nights ago that I have not been back in this beautiful city for way too long. And it is really a pleasure to be back here. I, I want to acknowledge that I come from Treaty 1 territory, Manitoba, uh, which is also the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. And I also want to acknowledge that the Parliament of Canada is not on treaty land. The Parliament of Canada is on unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and the Anishinaabeg peoples in the Ottawa area. And I got a little bit of a sunburn on Saturday at the Truth and Reconciliation Ceremony for September 30th for the National Day on Truth and Reconciliation on Parliament Hill. And it was a very powerful and moving ceremony. Um, it was accompanied, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, hopefully, if we get a chance for Q&A, by um, other demonstrations that were happening on Parliament Hill, and it really seemed to my ears like they were designed to interrupt 
and undermine the truth and reconciliation ceremony that was going on. And that was hard. That was really difficult to be there and to be so moved by what was happening and then to have this cacophony going constantly in the background. Um, but, you know, that's part of the reality of what we are navigating. And it figures somewhat into my decision to table S261. S, of course, because this is a bill that originates in the Senate. And um, mostly we deal with bills starting with a capital C because they originate in the House of Commons. Um, for me, I'm going to talk today about the role of lawyers in situations like this and the dilemma that many lawyers face in terms of how best to serve a client's needs when those needs may actually overshadow some very important principles of fairness and at times uh, actually as a means of covering up very significant wrongdoing, including what would be considered if there were a more open environment, actual crimes against other people being covered up. But before I get into the lecture, I want to give a special shout out of thanks to Norm Slotkin, Professor Norm Slotkin, I guess Emeritus Professor Norm Slotkin, um, who at a conference we go way back um, we were among a founding group of lawyers who ha had an organization called the Law Union. <laughs> and and um, one day Norm said to me, you know, we have this Salos chair at the University of Saskatchewan. Why don't you put your name in? I'm like, okay. And to this day, this um, we encountered many different experiences, including, uh, I'm sad to say, a... Uh, uh, death threats, um, so that my kids ended up going to school with plainclothes policemen. Um, and then I chaired some of the public meetings with a, uh, a vest on, a protective vest on. Um, so it was a very intense time, the early 1990s, and in this regard. And a lot of what we were being told had really not seen the light of day. And credit to the then Globe and Mail, uh, and I say that very carefully, the then Globe and Mail, uh, for deciding to really cover this issue and for digging in and reporting a series, actually a three-part series, which in turn triggered the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario to actually look for someone who was independent and would be seen and trusted as being independent to chair the inquiry, and that's how they ended up with me. Much to their regret, I might add, but anyway, that happened, that happened later. And so it was these discussions with patients, and then reviewing. Uh, I remember sitting on the floor in the basement of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario with boxes of files of these cases going way back, and, I, and some of you uh, may know of the Symes case, uh, Beth Symes, a lawyer and, and colleague, and Beth volunteered to help me, and we spent days and nights combing through those cases. They'd never really been reported on. And we could see a pattern that was very clearly emerging, which was about immediate silencing of the patients. So we got the new law in 1994, and I did not represent individual patients in cases because by then I was kind of radioactive for the medical profession and the college. But I did act as a quiet consultant, shall we say, and on a, on a volunteer basis in quite a number of these cases. And I experienced time and time again having quite long conversations, um, trying to provide my experience, my guidance as best I could around what the patients could prepare for. And we would get to the point where then there would be an offer of an NDA, an offer of settlement. 
And always that offer included those patients promising to never say another word to me, to never have another conversation with me. And it would just be like, done. And I, I had a number of occasions when over the years, and sometimes it was many years later, someone who had, with whom I had been involved in that quiet background way say to me, I wish I knew then what I know now, and I can't talk to you, and, I, and I'm sorry that I, I stopped talking to you, and there's so much I want to tell you, but I can't because I signed that agreement. And I thought it was going to fix things, and it, it didn't, but I can't talk about it. And I didn't factor that in, in a significant way in subsequent inquiries, but tried to address the fairness of procedures and the whole notion of voice and agency. And I think that's really what this boils down to as well, is the capacity of people to know that they can seek justice and that they won't lose their agency as a human being. They won't lose their voice. And many, many of these NDAs have stolen that from people, not just on the occasion of settling uh, their particular complaint, but from their perspective for the rest of their lives. The other aspect of NDAs that informed my decision to make this a priority is that um, because a lot of my practice, when it was possible to have Legal Aid Ontario support for these cases, which ended, um, well, in the late 1990s, but I was able to uh, be retained by a number of engineering students, women engineering students, from a very prominent engineering faculty in this country, who discovered that they basically had been serially raped by another engineering student um, with a very similar MO each time that this happened. And I represented them uh, in, for a period of time, and it really triggered for me the role of universities. And again, not in every case, but in many cases, and certainly in this particular case, a whole cover-up strategy from the highest levels. Of, of the institution. None of this can happen, though, without lawyers, right? We're the agents. We're the ones who are, are sought out for the advice that we can give, and NDAs come from lawyers saying, this is what you should do to their clients, and let me help you and making many of these non-disclosure agreements ironclad in silencing people for the rest of their lives. So, undoubtedly, non-disclosure agreements have a role in intellectual property, but they are being misused in civil settlement of harassment and discrimination cases. I would imagine that everybody with us today is aware of the knowledge that we gained over a series of articles um, about primarily Ashley Burke from CBC should get credit for a lot of the work on this issue with Hockey Canada. But it's not just Hockey Canada, it's Gymnastics Canada, it's Soccer Canada, it's most of the national sports associations that we have in this country. And they all have at least one thing in common. They receive federal funding to operate. So NDAs enable these secret settlements. And in many cases, they hide wrongdoing, and including wrongdoing that can amount to criminal acts. And they essentially buy the silencing of the complainants and the whistleblowers. They limit freedom of expression. And victims of harassment or discrimination are often subtly or not so subtly pressured into signing an NDA rather than go through a lengthy court process that risks their own privacy. And this is a common comment that I've heard from many individuals. They just became exhausted by the process. 
they became dispirited by how they were being treated. They hadn't the resources, they knew they were up against giants with resources, and they didn't have resources to hang in there for the long haul. And it was affecting them personally, it was affecting their families, it was affecting their work. So an NDA often is presented as the way out of that, and it can look very attractive in those moments of being really understandably overwhelmed by a system that is actually not designed to bring about the realization of, of, of justice or, or healing. In effect, I would argue that NDAs are weaponized. They're dangerous tools that prevent individuals from coming forward and disclosing information concerning abuse, sexualized misconduct, harassment, workplace terminations, racial gender discrimination, and sometimes just plain flat out illegal activity. And NDAs protect perpetrators. They allow them to continue to do harm without facing consequences, and that harm includes damaging entire systems in which people have to work and live. NDAs exacerbate existing power imbalances as abusers often occupy positions of power and authority and exploit their standing to essentially coerce victims into ceding their silence. NDAs can negatively impact mental health, trauma recovery, and they often limit sharing experiences or seeking therapeutic support from an elder, from a family friend, from a therapist, from co-workers, and people who are members of targeted groups in our society or marginalized groups in our society are, tend to be much more likely to be required to sign NDAs under various kinds of subtle pressure. For example, in the UK, in research that has been done recently, it's far more likely for black African origin women to report having signed an NDA, about 75% of the survey that was conducted, compared to their white, British, or Irish counterparts, about 28% in that study. NDAs began as ways to protect proprietary information, but they have become pervasive and lawyers have done this. Estimates now suggest that about 90% of the settlement agreements include one NDA as part of an overall release. There's only one place in Canada where there's actually a law that bans the misuse of NDAs, and that's in Prince Edward Island, and it's entitled the Non-Disclosure Agreements Act, and it was passed by the Prince Edward Island Legislature in May of 2022, so it's a fairly new law. And this was sponsored by former Green MLA Lynn Lund. This law is considered a very good model by industry experts, including Dr. Julie McFarland, who is a co-founder with Zelda Perkins, who was one of the Weinstein um, victims, and who broke her NDA, if you happen to have seen the movie She Said, you will see a whole depiction of what, what Zelda went through. And Julie and Zelda decided to create an NGO called Can't Buy My Silence. And a lot of the work that they've been doing, and I might add, with shekels, with very, very little money, it's incredible actually what they've accomplished with very limited funding. They've both put their own personal money, not only their expertise and time, into this organization and into building a body of knowledge that helps people understand how pervasive and damaging NDAs really are. The Prince Edward Island law applies to sexual misconduct, harassment, and discrimination. And it applies to NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, and to what are sometimes called anti-disparagement clauses. Or, of course, also we get just confidentiality agreements as a term that's used. So this is just a short overview of what PEI has done with its legislation. Because it's a provincial law, it covers all situations within the province of PEI. 
Notably, this law uses the language person and not employee as a way of bringing it outside the workplace environment and covering a wider range of people. It doesn't just apply to victims and aggressors. It also targets leaders who need to be seen as having a legal obligation to prevent harassment or discrimination in the places over which they have some control. This could include the heads of an organization where sexual misconduct is being reported and to look at how they respond, do they respond, and whether there is an, an outcome that creates some kind of justice as a result of how they've responded. For example, the PEI Act prohibits people like employers or board members from making NDAs that protect their bad apples, like the coaches in the Hockey Canada scandal or employees that are known to be harassing coworkers. The PEI law still allows for NDA use for the protection of intellectual property or where the victim requests the use of an NDA and I have a similar clause in, in my bill. But it restricts the scope of NDA use to provincial jurisdiction, of course. It has an enforcement provision allowing for a fine of up to $10,000 for the NDA misuse when found. Part of the discussion that we had last week, I co-hosted with Member of Parliament Darren Fisher and Dr. Julie McFarlane from Camp By My Silence, a second international roundtable. It's available on YouTube, on my YouTube channel. And we brought together experts from a number of different countries to have the discussion about what they've done in terms of NDA laws, what they're in the midst of doing, and what kind of learning we could gain from this kind of open roundtable discussion. I was very honored to have the Massachusetts State Auditor, Diana DeZoglio, on our, our roundtable Zoom, where she set out a very impressively comprehensive program. She is a former senator in Massachusetts, she is a former state representative in Massachusetts, and now she is the state auditor, the equivalent of our Auditor General. And she's taking a very comprehensive approach on the premise that a law is needed. So part of our discussion last week at our round table was, well, what about policies? Because Sport Canada has made some real progress in terms of strengthening their policy around NDAs for organizations, national sports organizations, like Hockey Canada, like Gymnastics Canada, through a policy. And so this opened up a really interesting discussion because, of course, as we well know, you can move much more quickly with a policy, typically, than you can with a law. However, I, I do want to report to you that, by far, the strongest consensus on this roundtable, in this roundtable discussion, was it sure, of course, you want to move as quickly as possible in as many ways as you can. And so, yes, if you can have a rapid policy change, by all means, but don't stop there. Laws are needed because there needs to be a consistency, there needs to be a reliability, and you don't want to end up in the situation that we have currently, certainly in Canada, which is a whole patchwork. And, and that makes it all the more difficult for anybody to navigate and actually access some kind of tangible justice. Having a clear law that sets out the standards, that allows people to know how to frame what it is that they have experienced, where they need to go with it, and places the onus where the wealth and the power resides in the institutions, in the management of those institutions. So here's a quick comparison of how my bill, S261, compares to the Prince Edward Island Act. So PEI limits the use and content of NDAs within the province. My bill targets NDA use that is tied to federal money to entities all across Canada. The PEI bill applies, sorry, Act applies to any agreement made in the province whereas my bill is limited only to agreements 
that make use of public funds that come from a federal funding source. The broader application of the PEI Act works because as a province, PEI has regulatory power over property and civil rights within that province. So the PEI law covers all agreements in that province. I can't, I don't have that scope when I'm bringing in a federal bill. My bill seeks to stop NDA use by cutting off the financing of these types of agreements and disallowing their use or their enforcement. This relates, of course, to NDAs previous to the law coming into force. And that is within, and I've used the term, entities. So I'm not talking only crown corporations. I'm not talking only national sports associations or any other kind of civil society organization that's receiving public funding. I'm talking about uh, uh, CBC. I'm talking about Sport Canada. I'm talking about um, all the various departments in the federal government and basically any entity in this country that has any kind of federal funding. So yes, I followed the money and the bill cuts off federal money for both the creation and the enforcement of NDAs. So I also look at payouts and the negotiating of NDAs. And by disallowing the use of federal funds for these types of expenses, I'm hoping that my bill will prevent taxpayer dollars from being used to silence victims of discrimination and harassment. And I also want to say that any province that takes the initiative, as PEI has done, and decides to enact legislation within their jurisdiction will layer very well. There's a high complementarity between my federal bill and any prospective laws at the provincial level. So Bill S-261, if it became law, would mean that entities funded by Canadians cannot use NDAs to silence victims and can't use taxpayer dollars to bully victims into staying silent, regardless of when the NDAs were signed. It also means that when NDAs are used, they have clear boundaries that allow victims to process what's happened to them and to seek healing. It should provide Canadians with transparency by requiring that the use of NDAs be reported publicly in Parliament so that we can see the impact of these agreements. There is another way also in which the transparency element is very important. So much happens in secret. Um, I'll just say in parenthesis, never in my life until I became a senator have I ever encountered such a patriarchal institution where secrecy is employed almost every moment of every day on every, anything of substance that happens. And where, um, in essence, senators do not have charter rights within the governance of the Senate of Canada. No one told me this before I agreed to be a senator. <laughs> so it's been a very interesting learning journey. Okay, I'll keep that in parenthesis for now. But because we don't have federal legislation on NDAs, we don't have any reporting requirement about where are they being used? How are they being used until we end up with the kind of scandal that we saw with Hockey Canada? And so the idea here is that what we did is we looked at the existing mechanisms. One of the hardest things to do is to create a new law that needs a whole new set of resources and a whole new set of mechanisms to, to implement that law. In my opinion, those laws generally do not result in effective longer-term changes because the resources never get put there or they fall away or there's just too much that has to be built and it just doesn't get built. So the accountability and transparency that I'm seeking in this bill is through what's called the Financial Administration Act. And the member of cabinet most responsible for that act is the president of Treasury Board, currently the Honorable Anita Anand. Already, the mechanisms are in place for the President of Treasury Board to make a regular report to Parliament about how different departments have used their money. 
and Parliament then can respond with more questions, and it is, a, it is a way of getting to what's really going on in what is often largely secret. And so we built on this, and we're adding in to the requirement for every minister, every department, as they're already required to report. They're already doing this. We've added on another set of requirements for them to report on NDAs. And they don't have to breach anyone's confidentiality to do it. They just have to state the facts. Are ND have NDAs been used in the past year? How much money was spent on those NDAs? How many people were affected by those NDAs? And so by having these specific questions in what already exists as a reporting requirement, what I'm hoping, should the bill become law, is that then you have the President of Treasury Board required under the Financial Administration Act, which is already her responsibility, to report specifically on NDAs. And what this should allow for is parliamentarians being able to respond to this public information, civil society advocates being able to respond to this information, again, without breaching anyone's confidentiality, to go, and the question would become, if the bill were to become law, how is it being spent to either create or enforce NDAs? So by amending the Financial Administration Act, is it requires this reporting, as I've mentioned, by the President of Treasury Board. Um, it also amends the Parliament of Canada Act in respect of the contractual capacity of certain public sector entities to enter into NDAs. It would disallow the use of federal funds for paying out for the litigation of NDAs when they are related to a complainant's experience of harassment, violence, or discrimination. The bill will create greater transparency, as I've already underlined, and the requirement for dollar amounts allows us to follow the money and to follow through on the basic operating principle of the bill, which is to cut off the money. And it's, in many ways, not a policy at all. It's a requirement. It's a new rule, and it has the reporting requirements attached to it. So the NDA scope would be limited, and it would not be allowed. So there's a clause in, in my bill that allows for the complainant to say, I want an NDA, for whatever set of reasons they may have. And this has been a very interesting debate with a number of very dedicated, very ugly stealing voice factors into the decision that I made what next steps can be taken in terms of pursuing potentially an ND. And people that are in the midst of this experience, we can't expect them to be there's their own advisors and to know all of the different wrinkles that occur within the use of this, this uh, legal tool. So in my bill, no NDA under any circumstances can block artistic expression, conversations with elders, friends, therapists, family, disclosures to medical professionals. So that is, I'm hoping, a way in which, as I've experienced in talking to so many that have ended up with NDAs, the realization of the impact of the NDA on their lives, on their well-being, on their mental health, on their productivity, can't be known at the moment that that decision is being made about in, well, involving oneself in an NDA. This goes over often a very long period of time. Um, one of the other things that's available uh, on my social media, I don't know if it's on YouTube, but um, that is a press conference that we held on May 9th, 2022, when I introduced the bill. And one of the spokespeople with me was Robin Brown, um, who is a federal employee, actually now, now retired, who spoke about how it took years before he reached the conclusion that he should never have signed an NDA that he thought it was like a kind of one-shot deal, and it just came back and reverberated through his life year after year after year. So one of the most, um, to me, encouraging things to happen 
is a very surprising high number of lawyers who participated in the Canadian Bar Association annual general meeting who supported a resolution that was put forward by Joanne Stark, a lawyer in BC, um, for uh, non-disclosure agreements in cases of abuse and harassment. And um, there's quite a bit uh, written, um, and the actual resolution is quite long, and it addresses employers, it addresses organizations, it addresses widespread and systemic use of non-disclosure agreements, and these are all in the whereas portions of the resolution. And the last is, whereas NDAs are routinely used to cover up abuse in schools, youth clubs, universities, organizations, and religious institutions, where revealing the details of the settlement may result in reputational risk or criminal charges against the perpetrator. Be it resolved that the Canadian Bar Association, one, promote the fair and proper use of NDAs as a method to protect intellectual property and discourage their use to silence victims and whistleblowers who report experiences of abuse, discrimination, and or harassment in Canada. Two, advocate and lobby the federal, provincial, and territorial governments to enact changes to legislation and policies to ensure NDAs are not misused for the purpose of silencing victims and whistleblowers. And it was a strong majority at the Canadian Bar Association meeting that actually accepted this resolution. I have to tell you that those of us who knew it was coming up on the agenda had told Joanne there was no way, no way, this was even going to pass. And I, I think it went up to like 78% in favor of this resolution. So I find this very hopeful because I think there's a shift taking place within the legal profession. I think there's some greater ownership on the part of individual lawyers and firms and associations that we as lawyers have responsibility here for the way in which we've seen an explosion of the use of NDAs to silence and to protect perpetrators. I'm going to end with that. I have no idea whether there's any time left. Yep. And, and if there is, I would welcome questions and comments. Very, very much like to hear from you. And I presume someone has a mic, or do I have the mic that needs to be passed around? No, there's, there's mics on. Okay. And if you do me the favor of just letting me know who you are, please. Hi, thanks so much for coming. I'm Heather Haven. I'm a faculty member here. Oh, Heather. Yes. Yes. How nice. So, yeah, this was really great. And, um, and I'm so glad you're here because um, I think you're right, especially when a lot of the disclosure around Hockey Canada came out and then there was activity in whether it was BC or your bill and, and elsewhere. I think this really, this issue of NDAs, people started thinking about it. And I will say, uh, from someone who actually knows that, you know, in civil matters, we often negotiate settlements and more things um, get settled than, you know, go on to trial. And recognizing that processes that people have to go through can be very costly, psychologically, emotionally, and financially. Um, the thought of, of taking away a settlement opportunity is, is a little bit scary, but it made me think more deeply but I think often when we were talking about confidentiality and settlement, we were often talking about confidentiality in terms of sums that were being, you know, monetary offers that were being made, not so, or that offers were being made at all, not so much about non-disclosure and, and the facts that confidentiality and non-disclosure have kind of come hand in hand now are, it's an interesting development, I think, over time as we've been, you know, uh, doing that. So I have a question about the use of NDAs and I'm very glad you touched upon this question about whether or not um, individuals, I'll say litigants or maybe victims, could request an NDA. And I recognize there is kind of both sides, the thought that, well, maybe they are going to be recommending that they do because otherwise you won't get a settlement. So there, there could be some argument there. But has there ever been a discussion about limited time NDAs? So when we think about non-compete clauses, say in an employment context, we might say, okay, 
yes, we recognize you'll have confidential information, client lists, whatever, but your non-compete will be geographically limited or limited in time, so two years or, you know, or whatever it is that, that is appropriate. And those tend to be, if they're limited, enforceable. Um, and when thinking about NDAs that are silencing victims forever, <laughs> right? Um, the question might be, is there some medium there? Could we limit the NDA in time? So it gives the perpetrator an opportunity, okay, I'm gonna go get help, uh, I'm going to you know, change something, I'm gonna learn more, I'm gonna figure out what I've done wrong, and allows maybe the organization that's supporting them to also take steps to, to try and, and make things better, but then not prevent the, the victim um, from being silenced forever. Like, is there mm -hmm. any thought of limited or, or limited in time, or would that, would that make sense in, in this context? I, um, I personally think it, it does make sense for certain situations. I think, though, that, and so I, I, I think it's, a, it's really up to, as is often the case, the lawyers involved to craft uh, the kind of agreement that is going to respect the, the law, should this become law, uh, as well as um, the balance between the interests of the um, employer slash alleged perpetrator and the complainant. However, I think that whether it's a year, whether it's two years, whether it's two months, that what this doesn't address is what is the pervasive problem, in my opinion, which is allowing cultures of abuse to flourish. And, and that's where um, the NDAs, for whatever length of time, if they're going to um, silence those who have the information that needs to be taken into account by those in power and positions of influence within the institution in question. So I wouldn't rule it out entirely, but I think that we're still left with a, a, a big need here, um, which is to make sure that a culture that creates and allows perpetrators to um, continue without um, any accountability or any change in that, in that environment. So yes, I mean, yes, that's entirely possible, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. My name's Cade Brozard. I'm a 3L law student here. Uh, my question stemmed from your comments about the encouraging vote at the CBA's meeting. I was wondering about the flip side of it. Um, organizations like Hockey Canada are coming under new management. Have they been supportive of your initiatives or has there been pushback from organizations that might be impacted from your bill? Um, I'm not aware of any organized pushback um, from organizations. It's really more of a silence at this point. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the change in leadership at Hockey Canada, bringing in a woman to head the organization, the change in policy at Sport Canada, which de facto, I think, bans the use of NDAs in this way, uh, will, will make a difference with national sports associations across the country. Um, my hunch is that from their perspective, this is not the time to push back. And uh, <laughs> that this, this would draw considerable public attention and media attention if they were to do that at this time. But of course, this is, this is the power of secrecy. This is the power of negotiations that you throw a cone over negotiations. You throw a cone over agreements coming out of those negotiations. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows uh, how to actually hold accountable leadership of organizations where this is allowed. Hopefully that would change by using the Financial Administration Act and changing the Parliament of Canada Act. I, I will say to you that you know I work in a place that loves secrecy. I work in a place I work in a place that just passed a brand new harassment policy that allows for NDAs. <laughs> and I was the only person in the entire chamber who spoke against it. And it passed smoothly. <laughs> so we've got big environmental issues here, social, psychological, corporate environmental issues here. And I, I think there's a, a, probably a, a bit of caution 
in many um, institutional leadership groups where they're, they're not going to come out and go, go for becoming cheerleaders for NDAs, but I'm not sure they've given up the idea at all. Thank you for coming today, Senator. Uh, my name is Abdullah. I'm a 1L. And my question is, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, so. Uh, it's okay. Take it That's as you why will. I'm here. <laughs> sure. um, would you, what, would you, do you, or what are your general thoughts on supporting legislation for c criminal sanctions against using NDAs for uh, silencing victims to circumvent the jurisdiction issue? With, like, I feel like a lot of victims will be left behind because employment is under. I, I'm, not, I'm not fully sure, we're still learning, but I think it's under provincial jurisdiction. Exactly, yeah. So do you think that that's a way to circumvent that issue um, so then victims aren't left behind? Such an interesting question, thank you um, for the question. Uh, it comes up over and over again in cases where there is a, an abuse of power that manifests in um, sexualized forms of harassment and or um, violence, various forms of discrimination. Uh, I have to qualify my answer by just saying that in other fact situations where I've been asked a similar question, most particularly in cases of sexual abuse by patients by regulated health professionals, most of whom are subject to regulatory bodies like their colleges, which have, certainly in Ontario, the codified process that I described at the beginning of my presentation today. Where I end up landing in forming an answer to that is in the same place, whether we're talking about NDAs or whether we're talking about um, the kinds of overall processes that essentially silence those who are reporting their experience. And that is, um, generally speaking, when you turn something into a criminal violation, the criminal law, we all know the criminal law is the sledgehammer of our legal system. We also know that we have numerous cases already where delays have meant that the cases did not proceed. We also know that even though, just speaking for myself, for more than 40 years, actually 50 years now because I went to law school in the early 70s, I've been actively engaged in trying to change systems, criminal as well as civil, in relation to people who have been violated um, through various forms of sexualized abuse of power. And um, the criminal, moving this into the criminal law creates, in my opinion, um, a lessening of the choice, the agency that, that people have. Um, at the same time, though, I need to acknowledge that many of the civil systems that we do have in place are not that effective and actually not that helpful to many complainants. But if we compare criminal cases in this area, um, including sexual assault, and we look at the issues that are identified by those who try to seek justice within the criminal system, I'm very sorry to say that to my ears, to my eyes, what I'm seeing and hearing is that after 50 years of direct personal advocacy in this area, I'm hearing the same thing. Hearing the, basically the same thing about the police, the same thing about the courts, the same thing about delays. So I don't see creating criminal charges as a panacea, mainly because I don't think we have the resources within the system to really make that work well. So I'm not opposed to it in principle, but speaking practically, I have real reservations. I think Hannah. Oh. Yes, yeah, Senator McFedrin, I'd like to thank you for being here with us today and delivering a fascinating lecture. And I'd like to invite one of our students up, Hannah Bouvier, oh. to present you with a gift and a special thank you. Hi, Senator McCutcheon. Um, on behalf of the College of Law and the students of the College of Law, I wanted to thank you for coming to speak with us today. I think it gave all of us uh, a lot to think about in NDAs and what it's going to look like in moving forward. So on behalf of us, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, um, thank you for your leadership.